like this. I was just born this way, and no one loves a monster. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. As requested, today we'll be exploring Cobweb, the recently released horror film written by Chris Thomas Devlin and directed by Samuel Bowden. Starring Woody Norman, Lizzie Kaplan, Anthony Starr, and Caroline Coleman, Cobweb revolves around the young Peter, who discovers a perturbing tapping noise from within his walls that begins to torment him. Unfortunately, sharing the new discovery and its impact on him with his delightfully eccentric parents, Carol and Mark, gives him no comfort. It's the stuff of childhood nightmares, yet his parents brush it off as a mere figment of his overactive imagination. Peter, I heard something. This is an old house. There's bound to be bumps in the night. As the eerie echoes persist, Peter's conviction strengthens, pushing him on a journey of familial discovery. After unearthing some dark revelations, it becomes clear that his guardians might also be custodians of a sinister secret. Through Bowden's trademark lens, we served a tantalizing cocktail of childhood scars, the perils of parental overreach, and the monsters they can create. In this video, we're going to explore the story, the characters, and the meaning of its ending. Giving us a glimpse into the visual signature of the film, and its prioritizing of showing and not telling, the movie opens with a vignette of Peter going through a normal day. His life revolves around dodging school bullies and navigating the emotional maze set by his parents, Carol and Mark, who are equally as controlling as they're distant. The boy is effectively a master in the art of avoidance, whether it's fixating on his desk, not joining in the fun of other students, avoiding eye contact, or getting lost in the classroom's scenic views, all while carrying a deep melancholy. Trying to sleep that night, he's woken by the sound of movement behind the drywall that culminates in a loud banging, forcing him to turn the lights on. Knocking on the wall to confirm the sound was real, he's horrified to hear whatever was on the other side knocking back, before seeking refuge in his parents' room. More annoyed and curious than concerned, Carol walks him back to his room and knocks on the wall, hearing nothing back. Insisting there was nothing there, she assures him it's an old house, bound to have bumps in the night. You have a great, big, beautiful imagination. And all those scary things, they're just in your head. Making things all the more horrible is the school bully Brian, played by Luke Busey, who wears the I'm the villain face with a family trademark flair, uttering threats of looming playground skirmishes, one of many students that torment him because of his size. On a seemingly ordinary day, as his classmates scamper outside for recess and the threat of a beating from Brian looms in his head, our introverted protagonist finds solace indoors, catching the keen eye of the ever-observant substitute teacher, Miss Devine. I don't like recess. You don't want to play with your friends? Noticing the fragile boy was scared of his peers, she asks him to help her put the Halloween decorations up. As he's about to nap on his desk, a spider appears in front of him and freaks him out. Teaching him to overcome this fear, Miss Devine helps him capture the spider and release it outside in a massive setup that pays off later in the most horrific of ways. Peter's life begins with the facade of domestic bliss that, quite frankly, crumbles faster than a cookie in milk. I want to dress up. I want to trick or treat. All the other kids at school get to do it. We're not their parents. Giving us a glimpse of their strict parenting style, much to the chagrin of Carol, his father Mark tells him a story about something horrible that happened a few years back. Apparently, before Peter was born, a girl that lived a few houses down disappeared when she went out trick or treating on Halloween. It was a very traumatic event for everybody in the neighborhood, and I personally don't like remembering it. While they calm Peter down by saying that they would never let that happen to him, we're not entirely sure if the story is real or a fabrication to scare him into submission, but the deathly glances from Carol and the homelanderish smile from Mark indicate that there is much more than meets the eye. Once again, as Peter sleeps the following night, he's disturbed by not only a sound, but also a voice that calls out his name from the wall, causing him to scream for his father. You know what? I mean, it's rats. With this, Mark takes Peter to the shed and introduces him to rat poison, which the boy notes smelt a bit like cinnamon, pouring some outside of his room. When his father realizes Peter was upset the rats had to die, Mark explains that they need to die because they spread disease, in addition to keeping his boy up at night. He also notes that sometimes you need to make tough decisions to protect your family, something the boy takes heed to in another big setup with a huge payoff. 
Every line that drips from Star's mouth, be it the cultivating pumpkins or teaching young Peter the joys of rat poisoning, all in the name of familiar protection of course, is laced with dual meaning tension. Then painting the other half of our parental picture is Carol, brought to life by the inimitable Lizzie Kaplan. Imagine tossing Misery's Annie Wilkes into a blender with the fervor of Carrie's mother, and you've got the high-strung cocktail that is Carol. This Stephen King-inspired mother figure has a wardrobe that screams more restraint than a straitjacket. Though the film is happily frolicking in circular fairy tale woods, Carol, with her ever-present cross necklace and janitor-like key ring, never lets us forget her devout ways. And those keys are not just a stylistic choice. Every door, and there are many in the Cobweb Manor, yields to her, making her feel like a twisted prison guard, while Mark gives the impression of a prison warden that takes a liking to his job. Stand up. I said, stand up. At school the next day, amidst the crayons and construction paper of their Halloween art project, Peter sketches the events of his sleepless nights. Obviously mortified by his artistic pleas for help, Miss Devine takes note and dips her toes into the familial enigma, only to face a brick wall, quite literally, of denial. Visiting the home, she's met by Carol at the front door, who's not too pleased about the uninvited guest. Noting she was a teacher herself before she became a mother, in a subtle clue to an event that changed her on a fundamental level, Carol is angry to find out what Peter had drawn. I see. Well, this is embarrassing. You see, Peter has an overactive imagination. I do appreciate your concern, though. Confronting Peter, his mother questions why he was asking strangers for help, before ominously warning that his imagination was going to get him into trouble someday. Undeterred, over subsequent days, Peter engages in whispered conversations with this unseen entity, discovering that she was named Sarah. Telling him not to be scared of her, she notes that he looked like he was in need of a friend. Cleverly offering to go away if he wanted, Sarah then tricks Peter into letting his guard down, with the boy then becoming comfortable with sharing his entire life with her. Things then seem to take a positive turn at school, with Miss Devine's relentless optimism starting to rub off on him. But when Brian knocks him over and steps on his pumpkin at recess, the boy begins to spiral back into misery and the arms of Sarah, who both love the company. When he shares what happened with Sarah that night, the voice in the wall emboldens him to stand up for himself. But instead of retaliating when pushed, Peter becomes the aggressor, stalking Brian and his friend before pushing his bully down the stairs and causing him to break his leg. Peter has never done anything like this before. He doesn't have a violent bone in his body. It was an accident. In the aftermath, Peter is expelled, and his father grills him about them not being a family that solves their problems with violence, something that is ironically later revealed to be a huge lie. When Carol then tells her husband that he had also drawn a picture of school of a child calling for help, Mark starts to flip out. As punishment for saying that he did it because of the girl he heard in his room, his parents ground him and confine Peter to the basement, where he stumbles upon a concealed pit, shielded by a grate in chains. We're doing this because we love you. Because we love you. Chatting with the principal the following day, his teacher notes how odd Carol was behaving at the home, but told that getting personally invested in every student would ultimately break her. She's advised to leave him be. The principal also notes the disappearance of Rebecca Holbrook a few years back as being the motivation for why Peter's parents might be overprotective, but with his dialogue cut with shots of Peter trapped in the basement, we know this isn't true. Despite no longer being a substitute teacher, after investigating the disappearance of Rebecca and worried to see Peter's call for help culminated in the uncharacteristic act of violence, Miss Devine decides to visit the home in probably the best sequence in the film. Under the false pretense of delivering the results of his last math quiz, upon which she'd scribbled her phone number, she's met by Carol and then Mark at the front door. Although they know that Peter is in the basement, quite sick of her intrusion, and much to the surprise of Carol, Mark invites her inside for coffee, with a hammer in one hand and blood dripping from a deep cut in his arm. Have a seat. Thanks. When he tells her he got the cut from renovations he's doing on the house, Miss Devine apologizes for Peter's misfortune. Told that they planned to homeschool him, she suggests that the boy might fare better in a school more suited to his needs, which flips a switch in Carol, who assumes that she was trying to take their child away from them. What, what is your interest in Arsa? You're no longer his teacher, so I, I, I don't... It's very strange to me that you continue to show up at our house. You don't know anything about... Hey, no, hey, No, enough. before I... What mother gives up on her child? Sweetheart, that's the enough. The audacity of this woman! Hearing the commotion outside, Peter tries knocking on the wall and gets the attention of his teacher, who initially confuses it for the loud washing machine. Told that she needed to leave, Miss Devine makes her way out, but stops when the washing machine halts, but the banging still continues. 
Turning around, she's met by Mark wielding a hammer, telling her the loud banging was in fact a washing machine, which begins its next cycle, indicating that she knew Mark was lying. Although he had a hammer in his hand, implying he was about to kill her, the tension is broken with Mark handing Divine her keys outside. Manipulated into conceding that he was telling lies, Peter is eventually released from the dark confines of the basement by Carol and Mark, who oddly wanted to live in delusion and continue on as though nothing had happened. She's going to teach you the three R's, Pete. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Of course, Peter doesn't waste time re-establishing contact with Sarah, who ominously insinuates that she was in fact imprisoned within the walls by his evil parents. She then drops a massive bombshell, professing to be Peter's old sibling, whom their parents decided to banish and forget. Who are you? I'm your sister. Hmm? I've been waiting, Peter. No, you're scaring me. You need to be scared. Mom and Dad, they're evil, Peter. Your time is coming. <gasps> Sarah effectively persuades Peter that their parents intend to eliminate her, and that he's next in line for the sealed confinement of the walls. Naturally, this causes him to have terrifying nightmares of his parents, which only solidifies trust in what his sister was saying. Hello? Mom? Look what you've done to your mother, Peter. This is compounded when, upon instruction from Sarah, Peter digs up the pumpkin patch and finds the skull of Rebecca Holbrook. Calling the number on the report card left by his teacher, the boy then urgently tells her that he needs her help, but hangs up when his mother appears behind him. Calling back, Divine is surprised to hear Carol on the line, explaining that she was the one who told him to call and say that he missed his teacher. Peter was just telling me how dearly he misses his teacher, and so I said, Peter, just give her a ring, tell her yourself. Dragging him to his room and discovering the hole in the wall that Peter was using to communicate with Sarah, Carol begins to freak out as their secret begins to rear its ugly head. Walking across the house with her hand on the drywall, half angry and half scared, she finally retreats to her room and warns Peter about what his father will do when he arrived. Now convinced that their parents were indeed going to kill them, to thwart this looming fate, he does the unthinkable. Guided by Sarah, Peter resorts to lacing their soup with rat poison and severing the phone line to prevent them from making any emergency calls. Peter? Peter, have you done something? What did you do? Tell me, what did you do? You hurt my sister. The dire act unravels rapidly, with Mark and Carol initially noting the food smelt like cinnamon. As he realizes what Peter had done, Mark then falls victim to the lethal concoction, spewing black vomit and blight on the table before dying, while a confrontation sees Carol accidentally impaling herself after a forceful nudge from Peter sends her tumbling down the stairs. Yet in her dying breath, she implores Peter, Peter! Driven by intrigue, contempt, and anger for his parents, Peter does the opposite, heading to the clandestine door veiled behind the grandfather clock and unlocks it. Unfortunately for him, emerging from the shadows is Sarah, whose malevolent agenda becomes apparent. Inspired by the spiders in a web that surrounded her during imprisonment, the girl with unusual genetics and a horrifying face that even a mother couldn't love has effectively morphed into a wall-climbing spider beast. When you were born, they were so happy when I was born. They screamed. Turns out she's been puppeteering Peter, craving retribution on their parents for her imposed isolation and nurturing bitterness for his unshackled existence. Just as his parents had said earlier, Rebecca had indeed gone missing, but what they left out was the fact that they were responsible. Before they'd confined Sarah, she was actually allowed to walk around the house. That wasn't until Rebecca knocked on their door trick-or-treating and laid eyes on Sarah, who begged her to help. Mortified that the secret of her monstrous disfigurement would bring shame upon them, both Carol and Mark then effectively killed Rebecca, buried her in the garden, and constructed ever more elaborate traps to contain their beast. They then began growing pumpkins around it, which symbolically continued to rot, indicating their secret was begging to be let out. Marred by pronounced deformities, Sarah was viewed as a monstrosity by their parents. This harsh judgment sentenced her to an abysmal, solitary existence in darkness, while Peter passed in the light of affection and relative normalcy, hence why she also wanted him dead. While you were whining in this warm bed, 
I was suffering among cobwebs and rats. But in a surprising twist, as she pursues Peter through the home, Brian, his older brother, and his bully friends arrive to terrorize the boy for breaking his leg. With Sarah opening the door to invite them, the curious douchebags enter the residence, breaking everything in sight. Unfortunately for the group, Sarah descends on them, using her long stringy hair as a web of distraction, her talon-like nails, and her immense strength and grip to tear them apart. As she does so, responding to the call for help from Peter, Miss Divine rushes to the scene, endeavoring to whisk him to safety. Yet as freedom seems imminent, Sarah lunges at her, scratching her leg before ensnaring Peter in the deep pit she'd been held in. Despite Sarah's desire for vengeance on Peter, he and Divine are able to injure his sister and confine her to the pit she'd been trapped in for most of her life. Yet, Sarah issues a chilling prophecy of her inevitable escape. Fast forward a few weeks and we find Peter assumedly under Mr. Vine's wing, adopted into a semblance of normalcy. However, just as Sarah had said, one night, the spectre of his past revisits, with Peter catching the haunting visage of Sarah lurking behind him, making us wonder if this was real or just another nightmare. Don't you see, Peter? It's in our blood. You killed Mom and Dad. You're just like me. No! I'm not like you. We're family, Peter. I will always be with you. Always. Samuel Bowden weaves an entertaining and original thriller, generously sprinkling it with flamboyant visuals and performances that border on the theatrical. A backyard teeming with decomposing pumpkins, eerily evocative artworks at school hinting at a cry for help, and the chilling voice in Peter's wall nudging him down a dark path. All of it exudes an ambiance reminiscent of a Del Toro-inspired bedtime story starring a boy and his nocturnal monster confidant. The journey of Woody Norman's Peter from a trembling, dismissed kid to a tiny titan of resolution is something to behold. He's the heart and soul of Cobweb, the anchor that grounds us amidst the whirlwind of suspicion and fear. In Norman, we see both vulnerability and determination, making us cheer for him every step of the way. They eat it? That's the idea. Then what? Lizzie Kaplan, portraying Peter's mother, takes us on a wild roller coaster ride from quirky to absolutely bonkers. Whether she's passionately butchering pumpkins, crafting emotionally loaded cupcakes that could give therapy a run for its money, or opting for some unconventional parenting techniques, she's captivating to watch. Did she tell you? <laughs> what did she tell you? <laughs> You just wait until your father gets home. Casting aside the menacing overtones of Homelander from the boys, Anthony Starr steps into the paternal shoes of Peter's dad. Admittedly, it was a bit challenging to fully dissociate him from his supervillain alter ego, but Starr manages to hold his ground, albeit in a subtler shade of sinister. I know you're awake, son. You get a good night's sleep. When I get home tomorrow, there's a problem we need to take care of. We're gonna bury the pumpkins, and we're gonna hope that the next crop is better. So I want you to pick up that shovel and dig. From the very beginning, we sent a chill in his hugs and a hint of dread in his whispers, with Star keeping us in delicious suspense until the curtains are drawn back to reveal the twisted finale. While Cleopatra Coleman's Miss Divine is a light in the darkest of times, showcasing gentle strength and the will to persevere despite her fear and trepidations. You don't wanna play with your friends? Okay. Look, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Like that. Pick it up. We're gonna take this to the window. Coleman steps into Peter's life as a substitute teacher, taking an immediate interest in our withdrawn protagonist who, quite frankly, would rather sketch harrowing illustrations than indulge in youthful frolics. Miss Devine's concerns soon escalate. What makes her so endearing is her relentless positivity and commitment to doing the right thing, despite the precarious situation she finds herself in. At its heart, Cobweb doesn't hide its identity. It's a horror tale, pure and unapologetic. Yet, with its serpentine plot and gasp-worthy reveals, it does an exquisite tango with unpredictability. The dread it builds is relentless, and its strength lies in keeping its audience in the dark, forcing us to rely on subtle reactions of each character and small details to put the puzzle together. Refusing to spoon feed the audience, it delights in its obscurities, but it's not all about the ambiguity. 
The movie skillfully incorporates spine-chilling sequences, the foreboding play of shadows, nightmarish scenes, unnerving dialogue, and a palpable, omnipresent atmospheric dread. I was delighted to see Bowden craft a tapestry of expected horror tropes, only to gleefully shred them with unexpected twists. At times, it feels like we're diving into a shadowy fairy tale, dark, brooding with gothic overtones, and throughout, there's a deliberate blurring of lines between Peter's reality and imagination, leaving audiences suspended in a delightful liminality. The visual artistry and set design, costume, lighting, and framing is particularly noteworthy. Exaggerated shadows seem to have a life of their own, buoyed by a score that feels like the sinister whisperings of an old house. The haunting musical composition and atmospheric sound with its foreboding knocks, chilling whispers, and the eeriest of laughter is an auditory journey straight into the abyss. With all that said, we do have a few plot lines dangled tantalizingly like threads begging to be tugged only to lead nowhere, and we have an abrupt ending that robs the film of its much needed resolution. After all, Peter did murder his parents, and without the guidance of Miss Divine, it's implied he might also be at risk of showcasing the same homicidal tendencies as his sister. Still, with the amazing character work, tense atmosphere, sharp script, amazing setups and payoffs, quick pacing, focus on practical effects, clever cinematography, and proclivity to respect the intelligence of the audience by showing and not telling, the rest of Cobweb more than makes up for it. It's refreshing to see a new IP that's so daring. It's just a shame that the movie found itself sandwiched between Barbie and Oppenheimer on opening weekend, before being fast-tracked to streaming within two weeks. To me, this was a major marketing and scheduling fail, as this is a movie that most definitely would have benefited from a Halloween release. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we cover Cobweb. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and check out the Film Comics Explained podcast on the second channel. And if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Trick or treat.